and, and Pastor Sean is right. We are starting a new series, and uh, this is a very important series because um, I, think, I think we have an idea of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, but I think it's our idea and not necessarily Jesus' idea. So what I would like to do is, is really paint a picture of what the Bible says. Here's, here's what it means to follow Jesus. Here's what it means to be, to be a disciple of Jesus. And today's message is really asking the question, um, how, many, how many Jesuses are out there that we're actually following that aren't even real? I, yeah, that, that's pause for effect. I didn't forget what I was going to say. That's pause for effect. Today, what I want to do is talk to you about three very popular Jesuses that don't even exist, that run rampant through the church. And it's not, it's not correction. It's not me trying to, to judge um, if, if anything, this, this is Jesus inviting people, his people, into a healthy understanding of him, of who he is and what he wants to do. By the way, a few moments ago, you saw me walk up on stage in the middle of worship and stop it. Did you see that? Um, something you need to know about me, I'm not at all interested in the show going on. I'm interested in what Jesus is interested in. He's interested in worship that's in spirit and truth. There was absolutely nothing wrong that Brad was doing. I didn't correct Brad at all. What I, I said to Brad when I walked up here is, Brad, do you, do you feel that feeling that we've talked about? Do you feel the disconnect between the congregation and the Lord? And he goes, I sure do. I said, then I want you to stop worship and address it. And he did. As a good pastor, he did. See, there's a, there's a verse, I can't spend a lot of time on this, but there's a verse in Psalm 23 that says this. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You're familiar with that verse? See, God's the one who prepares the table. We come in and eat, but sometimes when we come in, our hands are dirty. Our clothes are dirty. We got, we've got all kinds of stuff. When, when I say dirty, I'm not saying sinful. It's just, it's just, it's corrupt, but not evil. It's just this world. It's, it's cancer. It's what am I going to do about my finances? I'm so depressed right now. There's, there's all these things that are around us, right? And we carry it into the presence of God. And, and God's made this feast for us. We're eating right now. We've been eating for, for the last half hour. We're, we're in his presence together, corporately, and he loves that. We're going to have that forever. So we're eating, but it's our, our hearts and hands aren't clean. Not that it's sinful, it's just we're bringing in things. And, and we're here, and, and God's wanting our eyes to come up and be on him. That's where, that's where you begin to feel intimacy with him corporately is when our eyes together are fixed on him. I felt that. I just felt the heaviness. So I stopped the show. It's not a show, but I stopped the show. And I, I asked our worship pastor to help lead us to a place. And didn't you feel it immediately? Yeah, see, we need to be interruptible. We, we need to, to be able to move to the left or right. And, and I thank God that you're a congregation who, who is willing to be led. All right, let me pray. And then I want to uh, read some scripture to you. And we're going to talk about three Jesuses that don't exist. Father, I just want to thank you for today. This is really good worship. When we sense your leading and, and we follow you in obedience... And we receive from you what you want because, Lord, you are making a table before us in the presence of our enemy. Our enemies are all around us and they, 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 
they just want to put their talons in us and drag us down and keep our eyes on the things that, that this world tells us we should be thinking about. But Lord, we set those things down as important as they are and we focus upon you. You are life. You are truth. And you are the way. So we focus on you today. Jesus, thank you for being right here with us right now in the presence of your spirit. Holy Spirit, you are in us. You are around us. You, you, you have your arms all the way wrapped around us right now. And, and that includes people online, our friends in Cuba, Lord, all over, all over the world right now. Anybody that's connected with, with what's going on in this moment, in this space, your arms are around us and you're drawing us in. We want to see you and experience you and to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, how do you know if you're following the right Jesus? I know what you're thinking. Come on. There's no way I'm not following the right Jesus. I'm following the right Jesus. Nobody makes that mistake. Can I offer you um, maybe just a, a biblical picture, a, a picture. This, this comes out of Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Let me just read this. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So, so clearly, when Jesus says many, he was talking about people who thought they were following God. But weren't, well, pastor, come on. Those, those, were, those were people who were Jews, and he's, he's referencing the Jewish people missing the Messiah. So, so that's what that's about. That's not necessarily something that applies to the local church of today. I would like to introduce to the court evidence number two. Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, in his deep love and, and compassion for the church at Corinth, he, he says this, I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me. For I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Now check this out. Verse 4. For someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed. Or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Paul's deep concern for this church is that they were going to be led astray by a Jesus that didn't even exist. So do you think it's possible, maybe important that you and I talk about popular Jesuses that exist inside the church that often lead people astray. I think that's super important. So I have three for you in the few moments that we have together today. Uh, the first is my personal enhancement Jesus. My personal enhancement Jesus. Sometimes we never knew the right Jesus. And sometimes we started out knowing the right Jesus, but just because of life, because of experiences, because of improper teaching, we develop 
a Jesus that doesn't exist. So whatever, whatever condition you feel like you're in today, I just want you to listen because here's, here's the personal enhancement Jesus. Jesus gets me. He understands me and the way I am. I'm jaded with religion. I'm jaded by authority. I have been hurt. I've been mistreated. So he understands what I do. Even though I know what I do is not right, God understands because he knows what I've been through. And I have church heart. It's the funniest phrase, church hurt. Could you imagine going to a, a future employer and, and you, you say in the interview, I have corporate hurt. So don't expect much from me. I'm just going to work on the fringe of the company. Are you kidding me? But we do this with the Lord. We, we operate on the fringe. Here's two things that will help you see if you're following this unreal Jesus. Um, there are things that you do that you know are wrong, but you overlook it and you make excuses because of what you've been through. And you stand back from personal engagement with other people that Jesus, the real Jesus, would lead you into. Now there's times for rest and there's times to heal and be restored. I am not saying that. I, I'm saying that we, we have to take respite and rest and heal but that's not supposed to be a way of life is it that we're on the fringe of everything that God's doing because we don't want to get hurt here's the thing I want you to understand about the real Jesus the real Jesus heals people that's his heart intent the real Jesus offers healing forgiveness freedom he He's always got his hands open in front of you with whatever you need. He's always inviting you to health and vitality. He never stops doing that. In John chapter 8, verse number 11, it says, Jesus stood up and said to her, the woman caught in adultery, Woman, where are they? No, has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. See, Jesus offers healing. He offers forgiveness. He offers repentance. Now, I want you to catch something this morning. I, I think this is really, really important. The Bible uses the word redemption. Say redemption. Redemption. Yeah, the, the Bible uses the word redemptions, redemption for a reason. And, and Jesus in John chapter 3 even says you must be born again when he's talking to, to Nicodemus. I, I really want us to understand. For something to be redeemed, it means that it's compensated. There, there's, there's a worthlessness about it and it's grabbed hold of and it's redeemed and put into good use. If I went to, if you and I took a trip, we went to a, a, a junkyard and, and um, we saw this heap of metal that's almost settled into the ground. The, the, the tires are all flat. The rims are like halfway underground. The seats have all been chewed up by rats. The steering wheel is, is gone. The engine is in pieces. The roof is, is rusted out and watered. There's grass going, growing inside the cab. You, you would look at that and go, that is worthless. But if we, if we paid whatever it's worth, took it, and put it inside of a mechanic's garage, and they restored it to functionality, that's redemption. My concern is that many people... They think Jesus enhances. See, enhancing would be to take my car that runs fine down the road usually and, and um, put new tires on it, put windshield wipers on it, 
change the oil in it. I'm enhancing something that's already functional. And many people come to Jesus, not a real Jesus, and they say, Jesus, I just want you to make my life better. Did you know that Jesus has no interest in making your life better until your life has been redeemed? He doesn't and won't enhance anybody's life until they come to the place where they see themselves like that rusted out junk in the yard. That has to be purchased. It has to be built from the ground up. And anybody who believes that I'm starting a relationship with Jesus so he can enhance my life, that is not the real Jesus. Because he doesn't do that. In Luke chapter 14, verse number 33, we'll we'll talk about this in just a few minutes, but um, a little bit more. But um, Jesus said something very telling, very interesting. I have not heard many messages on this before. It's what prompted the comparison between uh, a vehicle being enhanced and and a vehicle being completely redeemed and restored. Listen to what Jesus said. He said, so therefore, anyone who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Do you hear any enhancement in that at all? I don't. I, what, what, what that leads me to think about and try to uh, understand is, is how I see me is going to determine how I need him. How I need Jesus. If I see myself as doing fine, but, but I just really want my ticket to heaven, um, and, and I see myself as fine, there's just certain areas of my life I'd really like to see under control. Jesus, I just need you to make my life better. Then I'm not following the real Jesus. But if I see myself as that junk, and Jesus is going to purchase me with his blood, put me in his garage, And he's going to restore the engine and the windshield and windshield wipers and put new oil in me. He's going to put fresh tires on me. He's going to paint the outside so it looks good. That's redemption. That's redemption. So let's talk about the second Jesus. This is the my culturally accepting Jesus. My culturally accepting Jesus. You see, Jesus doesn't follow culture as much as he makes culture. And people follow culture. We're really good at following culture. But but Jesus shows up in our lives and he gives us the culture of heaven. And then we have a choice. I'm either going to follow the culture of earth or I'm going to follow the culture of heaven but you can't have both and and do well at all there's two things that will help you see if you're following this unreal Jesus number one you're searching for a church that will accept you for who you think you are and you might often bounce from church to church to church to church waiting for somebody to give you permission to believe what you want to believe so that you can live the way that you want to live. And there's underlying anger for the church because you think they're so righteous. And it's not the church you're angry at, it's the Holy Spirit because he brings conviction. See, the real Jesus will draw you out of earthly culture. He won't push you into it. He draws you out of it. And this unreal Jesus lets you do whatever everybody else is doing. And that Jesus wants you to be happy. Jesus wants me to be happy. It's my rights. It's my entitlements. It's what I want to have around me that creates the Jesus that lets me live the way I want to live. And here's the lie that we we believe when we we do this. And that is um, Jesus doesn't expect or care if people obey his word 
That's the lie. When the truth is, he does care that we respect his word and that we obey his word. And if this is you, I think you might be more interested in finding something that supports your way of life rather than Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life. Well, I want to feel like I'm good with God and still do what I want to do. So I'm going to attribute to God what I believe. So God now believes what I believe. I don't believe what he believes. He believes what I believe. And I have a simple question for you. Who's who's God in that scenario? But that's how so many people today are. Well, I don't believe the Bible. I know. Because if you did, you wouldn't believe what you do about Jesus. And that's why I'm telling you, and that's why the Apostle Paul said, I'm so deeply concerned that you're following the wrong Jesus. A Jesus that you've made, or maybe other people have made, and now it makes sense to you. There's... There's things in the Bible that change, like should we have a church service, a church gathering in a big building or a little building? Should we have long hair or short hair? Do we wear casual clothes or do we wear do we wear formal clothes? Do we have loud music? Do we have soft music? Do we have drums or no drums? And, and there's so many different things in the Bible that God gives the freedom to people to decide for themselves, given the demographic and given, given the moving of the spirit. There are things in the Bible that change for sure, but there are also things that never change. All biblical truth is universal. It applies across culture. It applies across time. Fundamental universal truth has not, nor will it ever change. It's not going to change. Because all truth originates from Jesus, what he says. Jesus is very much up with the times. Because he's leading time to its conclusion. But I want you to understand, the devil always enters and tries to help us see that the truth of Jesus, you can always change it. That's the devil. But Jesus never changes. John 14, 6, it's going through your mind even as I'm speaking. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's what Jesus says. And he means it. What's he saying? All truth originates from me. Earlier, Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. And we don't build a new door Whenever the culture says, hey, we have a new thing. We have something more now. It didn't used to exist. It exists now. So so the door isn't rebuilt. The door to salvation is Jesus. And it's what he has said. It's what has been said and will always be said. It's what's true according to the Bible. Here's the last Jesus that I think is quite popular. And that's the my religious Jesus. My religious Jesus. And that's where we we search for Jesus in songs and services on the weekend. Weekend church attendance is where you think Jesus lives. So you go and you meet him there. I hear people all the time, and, and I love the saying, but, but uh, I, and I, I get where it's coming from, but, but I just feel the presence of the Lord in here. Well, is it the same thing you feel in your car when you leave, or, or in your kitchen, or in your workplace? And you just feel it more here. This is what I'm assuming, right? You, you just feel it more and more potent here. That's good. But I hope this is not the only place you feel the presence of the Lord. 
here's three signs that you might be following a made-up Jesus if, if you're struggling with this, my religious Jesus. And that is you, you down deep inside, you struggle. You struggle with fear of failure, fear of condemnation. You struggle with fear of rejection, being disqualified. You're critical of yourself and others. You, you have no spiritual depth. There's no prayer, there's no Bible reading, no intimacy with God. And, and all I have to say about that is, ah, I wish that wasn't the case for you. Because there's so much for you in an ongoing, deepening relationship with the real Jesus. Jesus hated this. He doesn't hate you. He hates this because it's a tactic of the enemy. And... and it, they weren't the first ones, but Jesus, because they were in his time, he went nose to nose, toe to toe, with people who peddled this and believed it. And here's what he said to them. You blind Pharisee. First clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you're like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanliness. And even right now as I'm reading that to you, you're feeling guilt. I don't want you to feel guilt. You're feeling shame, and I don't want you to feel shame. That's not what Jesus wants you to feel. What he wants you to feel is an invitation. An invitation to freedom. Here's what he says. He says, come to me, Jesus says. That's the real Jesus. Come to me. See, the enemy is really good at painting a picture of a Jesus that has holy contempt for you. And Jesus doesn't have holy contempt for you. Everywhere you go, every corner, every hallway, Jesus is there with his hands open and, and he has freedom he has joy, he has forgiveness, he has healing, he has restoration. You realize everywhere you go, and he's inviting you to know who he really is because we try like crazy to, to live righteous, and we think this, this hour or so that we have together this, this is the place where I'm going to find that, that righteousness. And I know my insides are broken, and I'm trying to do the best I can with the outside. And Jesus says, I have everything you need to heal and restore the inside. So the outside looks like the inside, but this unreal Jesus communicates to you and says, no, I'm just interested on the outside. Just look good. I'll take care of everything in heaven so don't even worry about what's on the inside. Jesus, the real Jesus, is saying, I always worry about what's on the inside. Please don't be deceived. Paul is, it's like the, the bottom of his soul is just being, it's bulging and about ready to burst because he's so concerned about the people in the churches that he oversees. You're following the wrong Jesus if you're doing these things. And the real Jesus is right by you. He's right by you. And he's inviting you. Luke 14, 33. Let me, let me finish with this. So therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple and and. Would there be a prompting in your heart and in your soul today to just say, oh, Jesus, I repent, I, I confess, and I have been chasing the wrong you. And I just want to chase the right you. So I, I'm just, I, I, I'm, I'm going to lay down all this other stuff, all these false Jesuses. And I, I'm just coming to you humbly and I'm asking, I'm asking that you would help me see who you really are. I accept your invitation. This series that we're in is exciting to me because it's all about shaping and forming. Jesus shaping and forming us. You're going to learn, Lord willing, 
uh, as we go through this series, what, what Jesus wants. And it's not a heavy burden, it's light. This world and the enemy and you yourself put heavy burdens on you. And Jesus is inviting you out of all of that. So today is a wonderful day to just simply say, Jesus, I repent. So I want to open up time for you to do some business with the real Jesus today. I want to invite you to um, just come and kneel and just say, Jesus, just want to pursue the real you and if that's all you can say you do that that's enough that's enough if you have other things that you want to talk to the Lord about this morning then I want you to do that as well so would you take a moment and just bow your heads just let me pray for you this morning and even as I'm praying if you feel the leading of the Holy Spirit to come and just kneel or stand and just pray, then I want you to do that. Don't let anything I'm saying hold you back. You can come right now. Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you that you're not smashing us with your thumb. You're not squeezing us. You're not fit to be tied with us you're not interested in how well we perform you just want a relationship with us inside of that relationship you reveal who you are and in understanding who you are you will change us on the inside and when the light of your presence helps us see us we confess we repent and we move forward God would it be no one here, no one here would be deceived. But we would all be pursuing the right Jesus. Because Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. And no one goes to the Father. No one will ever see the Father without first recognizing who you really are. still time if you would like to come forward and do a little business with Jesus some of those false Jesuses tell you that everybody's staring at you everybody's going to know how false you are if you go forward but it's the real Jesus who's saying come and meet with me just come and meet with me I'll give you something that will overshadow what anybody else thinks about you He's calling because he loves you. He's not calling because you're in trouble. That's the false Jesus again. He's calling because he loves you. Is there anybody else? Forget what everybody else thinks about you. And go to the one who died for you. Have a little conversation. Father, thank you for today. Thank you that you want to form us so that we can hear you and know you. Oh, thank you for your grace and your 